Hello, welcome to today's edition of Pegasus Test. On today's edition, we're covering the gear I used at Desert Brutality 2020. All right, if you've been watching our series on Desert Brutality 2020, uh, you know that I shot in two divisions. I shot in Retro Heavy, and then I shot in Armored Plus P. And what this video is about is a review of the gear that I used. So in Retro Heavy, I was kind of into the cosplaying spirit a bit, and I went as Royal Marine Commando in uh, Falklands era. And I thought I nailed it pretty close by looking at pictures, and then I ran into uh, the bloke on the range who uh, informed me that no, in fact, uh, I was uh, off on a lot of points, but uh, I guess I was there in spirit. Anyways, let's do a close-up of the gear and uh, explain what you're seeing here. Alright, first up is the rifle. And I am using a uh, FNFAL. Well, the first thing, if you're reenacting British Royal Marine Commandos in the Falklands, you know they used L1A1s, and they're not exactly FNFALs. But I figured, you know what, close enough. Um, this thing uh, is actually... A Rhodesian rifle, if you take a look here at the serial number, I don't know how that's coming on camera, but it is a Rhodesian R1 uh, receiver. I put it on a DSA uh, upper uh, to comply, and I have put the correct amount of 922R compliant parts in there. Um, the reason it is not all camoed up in baby poop is like the Rhodesian had is because it did come that way, but the stocks I received with the kit were so damaged, they were completely unusable, and I had to throw them away. And what I had ended up with was just a little portion on the lower receiver right here. So I decided that, hey, you know what, that little bit, I'm not going to replicate it, I'll just take it off. And I thought it looked pretty nasty anyways, because at the time, I didn't realize that this rifle was a Rhodesian R1. I bought a South African R1 kit, and, um, you know, in retrospect, had I known, I would have preserved all those stocks and just lived with them being cracked up. But anyways, so, as you see, moving up the rifle here, where there should be a screw uh, holding on these handguards, there is a zip tie instead. <laughs> That's because on stage four of Retro Heavy, in the uh, coronavirus party stage, uh, I had crawled up on top of the container, I'd stuck my rifle through, and with the first shot, the right side handguard came off. Or, excuse me, the left side handguard. And um, that was kind of disconcerting, but the rifle was functioning, so I kept rolling with it. And, you know, three, four shots later, the right side handguard comes off. And, uh, okay, definitely more disconcerting, but, you know what, the rifle's still functioning, so I'm going to roll with it. And uh, I made a critical mistake there. Let the barrel, the exposed barrel, rest on the uh, barrier, and what do you know? That affected my shots. I started missing, and by the time I realized what I did, I ran out of time and parred out, which was a bummer because I had four targets to go. So that was four penalties I took through my own stupidity. Okay, for a pistol, there was only one real option: Browning High Power. And uh, here it is. This is one. It's an Inglis, an Inglis Mark I Star. So technically correct. The commandos could have been using these, and probably most likely were using them in the Falklands. And the pistol, it performed well. I think there was one time I had a uh, round, an object, and I had to manually cycle it. Um, that could be to any number of factors. I'm not going to blame the pistol, but if I had to blame something, it's probably the World War II era magazine I was using. It's just probably coming to the end of its life. Um, this is a fun pistol to shoot. It's probably one of the favorites in my collection. And uh, it's pretty much as it was issued. The only difference is right here, the front sight. Somewhere along the line, some British armorer mucked around with this. And don't know why, but it's not a correct front sight for it. It hasn't been properly glued, as you can see. And if you try to get a sight picture down it, it's just way too big for the notch in the rear. So whenever I aimed at a target, it was exceedingly difficult to see and get my sights lined up properly. Um, and you'll notice the difference if you've watched the video that the pistol sections go much quicker with the H9 or red dot, obviously, as compared to an iron sighted Browning high power. Last, we move on to uh, my 782 gear uh, that I was using, uh, or as the British call it, 58 pattern webbing. Um, if this looks familiar to you and you follow the channel, you will recognize this. This was the exact same webbing I wore during Red October 2018. 
and uh, check out the link below if you're interested in seeing that for my majority of my comments on it. Um, while it was period correct to use, and there are some things that this webbing does fairly decently, I won't say well, but decently, um, I hate it. <laughs> be straight up, I hate it. It's made of uh, canvas duck or something like that, and in moisture, this thing sucks up water like there's nobody's business. And in heavy rain, and then when it sucks up the water, you can literally feel it tightening down on your body. I mean, it probably gains pounds in weight. I haven't scientifically measured it, but I'm sure it's that. Um, you will notice that there are some US pouches on here. Uh, the first thing is, right here, most importantly, is the US M12 holster. And that is because the proper holster that I have for this, I did not think it stand up to the rigors of a brutality contest. And it was not worth taking a penalty for losing my handgun or a DQ, more likely, just because I was trying to be historically accurate. You'll notice that the canteens I have are US style, and that's because when I got this kit years and years ago, the canteens that came with it were beyond nasty, and I just threw them away. Um, and you have the kidney pouches for the rations, and over here you can see the field expedient repair that I made with paracord because the clip's gotten bent and will not stay on the belt. So I made this during October 2018. It's working, so I've stuck with it. And last but not least, for my spare magazines, I went with US GI magazine pouches for the overwhelming reason that I didn't have any correct British pouches and I had to hold my magazines. So uh, that's what I went with. All right, let's start up the uh, rifle. Armored Plus P Division. Uh, this is the gear I ran. Let's go ahead and go uh, close ups and go over nice it in detail. Lend me this rifle for the competition, and it was an experience to shoot. I mean, 30 out 6 power, when most people are using 556, five, you definitely knew there was a difference. And when the gun went off, everybody knew. It wasn't the, uh, if you've watched the videos that I've put out so far about Desert Brutality, it wasn't the perfect choice for the type of match, but that doesn't take away the fun factor of it at all. It was a blast, literally. There was sometimes so much dust kicked up by this that I couldn't see the target. And as one RO remarked on one stage that when that thing off, went off, the reverberation was just killer. So it was fun to shoot. Uh, it had some issues, uh, mainly. They were caused by the ammunition, not by the rifle itself. The rifle was pretty spot on. Uh, the accuracy was definitely there within the limits of the ammunition I was using. And for the record, the ammunition I was using was some Pakistani military surplus. And, you know, not the greatest ammunition ever in the world. Now, originally, I had started out using Hornady M1 Grand Vintage. And because it's at such a low pressure to not break op rods on M1 Garands, it uh, did not cycle reliably in the gun, even though the gun has an adjustable gas regulator. And um, so, on the recommendation of Ohio Ordnance, they said, go with Greek, Greek HHP. Like, okay. I grabbed some, and it worked fine. Uh, problem was, I didn't have enough for the match. But I did have some of this Pakistani stuff I'd picked up on a deal years ago. Ran some rounds through it, and uh, by and large, it seemed to work. The problem I ran into was hard primers. I had a lot of hard primers that I had to deal with. And just about every stage, with the exception of, I think, stage five, I had to eject multiple rounds that had hard primer strikes that just didn't go off. Also had a case on two stages, stage four and stage five, where the um, gun had case stuck in it. And that was just frustrating. The first one was really bad, uh, and I had to take a mulligan to get it cleared. The second one, I was able to get cleared on the clock, but even then, by the time I got it cleared, I'd run out of time to finish the stage, which was, as you can see, frustrating. All right, next we got the pistol I used, and I was using a Hudson H9 uh, with a Blue Point uh, Delta Point Pro red dot that was uh, installed by Kate Yarms. And as you can see here, I got her dirty, really, really dirty. And uh, yeah, and it was awesome. The pistol did not quit. At no point did I have a handgun malfunction of any type. She performed flawlessly, as you would expect, and. You know, any stage that I used this on, I got my hits quickly, and any hits that didn't come quickly were just the fault of me and not the firearm. Overall, this was a great gun. The only limitation I found that it had was its 15 round magazines. When it came up on the spinner on stage four, it just didn't have enough capacity to get it over. Okay, 
when you have a pistol, you have to have a holster. And what I've got here is a three gun hybrid holster from CNG Holsters. Uh, this was custom made by them, uh, custom ordered, I should say. And I made it for my H9 to have a red dot sight on with suppressor height sights. Uh, it uses a simple bale for its retention with a thumb release, as you see. And the holster performed well, which was good because I was definitely worried. I used the same type of holster at uh, Tiger Valley earlier in November of 2019 for one of my Glock 34s and the holster completely failed. And being this is the only holster I have that really fits an H9 well in this configuration, I was, I was sweating it. But you know what, it performed well throughout the stage and I have no complaints. Also, uh, it was attached to a Blackhawk enhanced web belt. Uh, please check out the uh, link in the description below for a video we've done on that previously. Although I ended up not using them during the match, uh, I had a magazine pouch on here holding two magazines for my H9. I also had a pouch on my armor that we'll cover here in just a sec, and that was holding two magazines as well. So I completely overdid it on the pistol ammo, but I figured better to have and not need than to need and not have. And also, there was a requirement in Armored Plus P, and I believe in Scout as well, that you had to have a knife with you that had at least a 4 inch blade. I choose to go with a Glock knife, and the only modifications I made is I put some extra Pencott Green Zone camouflage on the sheath, and I wrapped the handle in paracord for no other reason than because if you have meat hooks like mine, the handle on the Glock knife is pretty skinny. And by wrapping some 550 cord around it, it beefed it up just enough to make it comfortable to use. And if you check out my video on Stage 5 Armor Plus P, you'll see that this uh, knife came in handy because I had... Alright, one of the requirements of this stage, uh, or this category that I shot in of Armored Plus P, was a bump helmet. You had to have one, and, or at least an armored rated helmet. And what I chose to do is I went with a Team Wendy bump helmet, and it performed the job perfectly. did a great job. It was comfortable, light to wear. Uh, also cool, which was nice when the sun came up, not so much when it was bitterly cold in the mornings. Um, like any good bump helmet, it is completely adjustable by having a strap system that can be adjusted in all the dimensions. Uh, at no point did wearing this helmet become fatiguing at all. It also, because it has an integrated night vision mount, made a convenient mount for my GoPro for the footage I got. And of course, covered in Velcro to put many convenient moto patches on. Last and certainly by no means least, and actually probably the most important part of the gear next to the rifle and the pistol, is the armor when you're in Armored Plus P. And this is what I wore, a Diamondback Tactical System. And this is an older style vest. I think I got this in 2004 or 2005, something like that. And I've kind of tailored it over the years. Uh, when I first got it, it was all in Coyote 10 because that's where it needed to be. And as things have progressed over the years, I've upgraded pouches and try to generally convert the color screen scheme to a more woodland type as that's where I'm more likely to use it in the near in the, in the here and now. Um, so I was carrying the required four magazines and I had pouches here and I had pouches here. These wrapped around and uh, velcroed on the front and held in place. I had an admin pouch of which mainly I used to control my uh, drink tube. In addition to that I had a uh, pouch here for my IR strobe. Not that you need it in a competition like this, but what the heck, why not? Also, as you can see, the shoulder straps on this are just thin material, not well padded, so from a previous interceptor vest I had, I kept the shoulder protector pad thing and integrated it into this, and this makes it ride a whole lot more comfortable. Moving around to the back, I have a hydration carry system. It carries three liters. I have a grenade pouch because, you know, why not? and uh, an IFAC and a radio pouch. I elected not to run a radio to, on during Desert Brutality because there was absolutely no need to, uh, but I had the option if I wanted to. also had my tourniquet pouch. So I met the requirements of the division and carried entirely too much stuff over what was required. You basically had to have uh, a liter of water. Well, I had a Camelback full that held three. Um, you had to have an IFAC. I got that in spades plus tourniquet. Got that. Uh, this armored vest is stripped down actually from what it normally is um, because this vest in and of itself will protect you from any pistol rounds without the plates in it. I've got two plates in it to comply with uh, the standards of the class and I decided to lay off a lot of stuff. There is 
attachments to integrate here that give you shoulder, uh, uh, your bicep protection. And also, down at the bottom, there's attachment points for a sporan, basically, to protect your privates. And extensions that go down and provide armor from your uh, hips all the way down to your knees. And uh, this thing was heavy enough as it was. And just adding all that extra stuff just seemed like you know, it wasn't going to be fun if I did that. So kind of went with this more uh, reasonable version, shall we say. Shooting the match in two divisions back to back was an interesting experience. Not sure it's for everyone. Uh, it's definitely physically demanding. Uh, the name's Brutality for a reason. Um, but it was fun to do this uh, in Retro Heavy, for example, uh, because there was an historical context. I tried my best with the resources available to me to replicate, replicate excuse me, a Royal Marine Commando in the Falklands. And I think I got fairly close. Uh, not 100% accurate by any stretch of the magazine, um, imagination, but it was fun to run under those conditions and in a match environment accept limitations that you have to accept in a combat environment that don't help you out in a match environment. For example, magazine pouches. These British slant magazine pouches are great for holding magazines um, and not losing them in the field. Okay, well, they're about average, honestly. Um, <laughs> but they do hold your magazines. They're not for speed at a competition. Uh, same with military-style pistol mag pouches. They are very good at not losing magazines. They're not so good for helping you speed reload. Uh, and a military flap holster is essential in the field for keeping not only your weapon from being lost, but also keeping it uh, free from dirt and debris. And the M12 holster does spectacular at that. It is the gold star standard in that category. Um, but none of these things help you speed up your performance at a match. That being said, they're also not a major detriment either in the fact that shows in the match in Retro Heavy I was able to come in third place. So it didn't help me overall, but it didn't hurt me that much either. Over on the Armored Plus P side, you know, uh, I was going with the spirit of the match. I could have done like my teammate chose to do. He met the requirements in the most minimalist fashion available to him, and that was definitely a thing that helped his score, um, whereas the weight on me was definitely slowing me down. Uh, I was carrying a rifle that was two standard ARs in weight, probably a little bit more, and probably about three what would stoner do rifles, and there was a penalty paid for that. Um, also, uh, I had stages where my gun is throwing up massive dust clouds, yet the competitors are not, and that caused delays to me. Um, not only that, 30-06 recoil out of that 18-inch barrel with no uh, compensator or flash suppressor on it. One, massive obscurant of the uh, sight picture, and two, it just takes time to get back on target, especially if you're using anything above 1x magnification. Um, but overall, it was still worth doing. Um, it got the chance to test this gear out. It's gear I uh, used in operational uh, situations in the past. And I had confidence in it now. I have com uh, had confidence in it then, excuse me. I have confidence in it now. Is it perfect for a match? No. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. <laughs> but that doesn't take the fun factor away. And that's one of the very cool things about brutality events is having fun is part of the equation. We hope you found this gear review helpful and informative. Please comment, like, and subscribe. And tune in for future competition videos.